Good morning. Uh, my name is Alberto Canestrelli. I'm doing a postdoc at Boss University with Professor Sergio Fagrazzi. Uh, this was supposed to be a tag team presentation with uh, either Sergio Fagrazzi or Andrea Dal Paus, but uh, neither Sergio nor Andrea were able to be here today. So in the first part of the presentation, I'm going to show uh, some simplified models that uh, Sergio and uh, Andrea develop, developed on uh, the, the uh, tidal channel uh, morphodynamics. And in the second part of the, pre the presentation, I will show you some uh, uh, numerical modeling I did with a, a complete set of equations solving the hydrodynamics uh, field and the morphodynamics. So what do, do we mean with the uh, Tidal channel. Tidal channel is a, a stream that is mainly affected by tide and in which uh, fresh water and river, and river sediment discharge uh, can be considered negligible. And uh, why uh, an estuary is, uh, can be considered like a transition zone between uh, the river environment and the marine environment. And usually when we study with models either tidal channel, channels or asteroids, uh, the horizontal scales are mar much larger than the vertical depth. So vertical acceleration uh, component, the vertical acceleration component is relatively small, and so we can uh, assume a hydrostatic pressure distribution on the vertical. If a vertical stratification is important, we usually use a 3D model if uh, the, wa the water is vertically well mixed, uh, we usually use a two-dimensional model. That, that means that the, the three-dimensional equations are vertical averaged. And so uh, the model provides uh, vertical averaged uh, quantities as a, res as a result. So this is the classical two-dimensional shallow water equation equations. Uh, the the first two are the momentum equation along x and along uh, y, while, uh, while the third equation, equation is the continuity equation. Uh, in these equations, eta is the water surface uh, and d is the water depth, and zb is uh, the uh, bottom elevation. So I want to show you how these equations can be simplified in the case we consider a tidal channel flanked by a salt marsh, uh, if uh, we assume that uh, the tidal propagation across the, inter in the intertidal areas flanking the channel is dominated by friction, and th this is usually true because the uh, salt marshes are uh, widely vegeta veg vegetated and the vegetation largely increases the uh, friction of the salt marshes with respect to the friction into the channel. So if uh, this, this, this first hypothesis is usually satisfied, then if we consider that the uh, variation of water surface from the salt marsh to the average water elevation at time t is uh, much smaller than the depth on the salt marsh, and if you, we consider that the salt marsh bottom topo topography is nearly flat, we can simplify the, the system of equation. We can neglect the inertial terms on the left. Inertial terms on the left, we can neglect the uh, turbulent fluxes on the right. And so we can basically assume a balance between the water surface uh, gradient and the friction on the salt marshes. So if we put together these momentum, simplified momentum equations with the continuity equation, we find out we obtain this uh, Poisson equation. Moreover, if you want to fully describe the uh, uh, water uh, surface, uh, and the uh, flow field in the entire salt marsh, entire, entire system made of consisting of salt marshes and channels, 
we can assume that the tidal propagation within the channel network is instantaneous compared to the propagation across the shallow salt marshes or tidal flats. We are, we are here considering small uh, so, uh, like, uh, areas like salt marshes of the order of hundreds of meters. Huh? So in this, for short uh, uh, tidal basin, this is a, uh, usually a good approximation. And prescribing the uh, uh, no flux condition around the boundary, so having the instantaneous propagation of, uh, of the tidal wave along the channels, we uh, can uh, uh, solve these equations with the following boundary conditions. What, what do we obtain? We obtain the water surface on the salt marshes. This is a, a, an a exaggerated water surface. This uh, uh, difference of the water levels are actually really small of the order of millimeters. If you imagine like a basin of hundreds of uh, meters, uh, the differences between the marshes and the channel are very small. And once you have the water surface uh, elevations, you can uh, compute the, uh, uh, through the uh, deepest, uh, steepest descent method, you can uh, uh, compute the direction of drainage. These are the direction of drainage. And knowing the direction of drainage at each point of the salt marsh, you can find out the watershed of each uh, tidal channel. So here on the right, we have uh, uh, the salt marshes uh, on the uh, north part of the Venice Lagoon in Italy. And uh, we, uh, we uh, compared their, their discharge computed but the maximum discharge is computed by the model, uh, by the simplified model, with the discharges computed by finite element model. So this is the grid of the finite element model, and this is the comparison between the discharge on the simplified, computed by the simplified model, and the discharges computed by the finite element model. And this is these are the maximum discharges. You can see there's a good agreement between the, the the two, uh, the two values. And this is uh, very important because the, we, we consider that in the tidal channels, the maximum discharges are the formative discharges. And these uh, maximum discharges, discharges usually occur when the uh, water surface is uh, lowering on the salt marshes, and uh, the salt marshes are drained by the tidal channels, and uh, you have the maximum uh, exiting, exiting discharge uh, when the water surface is right above uh, the salt marshes surface, as it has been shown in a in field by different uh, uh, researchers. So, how do you describe statistically a tidal network? You can describe the tidal network through the unchanneled path length. Uh, or overmarsh pathways. So if you imagine that you parachute uh, on the salt marsh and you follow the steepest descent direction of the water surface, uh, you can compute for each point the unchanneled path length. So this is the unchanneled path. These are the unchanneled path length computed for different salt marshes uh, in the uh, Venice uh, Lagoon. This is a semi-log plot. You can see that uh, the, uh, the, this is the probability this distribution uh, probability, uh, distribution of probability of the unchanneled path length. You can see that there is a, a linear, kind of a linear behavior of the uh, pro probability. That means that uh, uh, the uh, unchanneled length are typically characterized by the tendency to develop an exponential decay. So there's no, there's no power law. And so there's, there's not, there is, you, you can say that there is a, an absence of scale-free network features. Also, between uh, adjacent uh, tidal marshes, you have that the mean of the uh, distribution is different among adjacent sites. So this is the model. This is the morphodynamic model. So how do we uh, arrive to the 
at, at the, dis the description of the uh, planimetric uh, evolution of the tidal channels from the water surface gradient. So if we suppose that the time scale of initial network incision is uh, much larger than the time scale of channel meandering of a marsh platform growth and changes in external forcing, like relative sea level rise, we can decouple the initial network incision from slower processes. And if we uh, consider that the headward channel growth is driven by exceedances of a critical shear stress, and if you consider instantaneous adaptation of the channel cross-section to the local tidal prism, we can find the evolution of the tidal channels in the salt marsh. So this is just an example of how the tidal channels carve the, water, the, the bottom uh, surface of the, of the salt marshes. We consider that the landscape forming events are due to the spring peak discharges. And uh, to uh, assess, uh, to, co to compare the, the result with, the, uh, with the, uh, the configuration that we find in the real world, we, we use uh, uh, the PDF of unchanneled flow length. So what about the hypothesis uh, I just talked to you about? Like this is a uh, we said that we consider that the, um, the, the channels carve the salt marshes through uh, the in a headward process. And uh, you can see that this is, uh, this is the computed bed shear stress uh, on uh, two salt marshes of the Venice uh, la Lagoon. And you can see that the higher values of the shear stress uh, are on the tip, on the uh, landward end of the tidal channels, and on the uh, meandering band. And the headward, the headward growth character of network uh, development has also been shown by Hugo et al. on some uh, mm, mm, marshes of the Muddy Bay in the South Carolina. You can see that in 1968, the channel was in this location. And in like 30, about 30, 40 years, uh, the channel carved the salt marsh uh, through a headward uh, process. And uh, we, we uh, also consider that the uh, section of the tidal channel instantaneous adapt uh, to an equilibrium uh, section that is given by this uh, uh, power uh, law that relates the uh, watershed area with, uh, sorry, the area of the section with the tidal prism. So this is a, a, a comparison with a, a, a spontaneous uh, tidal creek network that was uh, ge uh, that generated that carved a salt marsh in the uh, Venice uh, Lagoon. So this is uh, uh, in this area. Oh, sorry, in this area, a restored salt marsh was uh, was built, and uh, it has been seen. So this is a study site. And these are the photographs of the study site. You can see that uh, very fast, from 2000 to 2002, the, uh, this is an initial channel that was carved uh, on purpose. And this is a, these are the natural channels that formed after two years. So you can see that the time scale of the, of the um, formation of these tidal channels is, a, is really short in this case, 2002. Uh, here and also the this is the uh, this is 20, these are 20 meters so the the, the this uh, length is about uh, 100 meters so we, we, we can consider it a short basin. This is the these are the modeling results and on the upper line you can see uh, the results obtained with a shear stress critical shear stress of 0 0.15 pascal. On the lower line. The results obtained with a shear stress, uh, critical shear stress of 0 0.25 Pascal. With a lower shear stress, uh, you clearly have uh, a, an increase uh, of uh, uh, tidal channels on the, on the salt marsh. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we also have different behavior using a different value of this. Uh, this is a statistical parameter. Without entering on the detail, we can say that if you use a small parameter t, you have that the you have a kind of a deterministic 
uh, carving of the uh, salt marshes surface, uh, while if you increase this parameter, you have more a uh, random uh, character. This is due to the fact that you random choose uh, the value uh, of the maximum shear stress uh, of the pixel having the maximum shear stress on, in, on the area. In this case, you always choose uh, the pixel having the maximum shear stress. Here, you can choose also another pixel. So, for example, in this case, uh, this uh, pixel was selected, and it was not the, the pixel having the maximum shear stress. And this is the, the real network. So, from a statistical point of view, this is a comparison between the uh, and channel length, uh, the PDF of the un channel length uh, on the uh, generated network and uh, on the real network. There's a good agreement between the, the distribution as this kind of the same behavior. Uh, the, the decrease at the end is due to the fact that you have just a few points uh, with a large uh, un channel length. So you can reproduce. Uh, uh, point-wise uh, the tidal channels, but from a, a statistical point of view, the uh, generated uh, tidal networks resemble the, uh, the, the real network. Now I'm going to show you some results uh, uh, about the, new, um, the numerical, numerical modeling of uh, the long-term profile of a tidal channel uh, com compared with the experimental results. So this is, our, the, this is the first uh, um, experiment, physical uh, laboratory experiment uh, that it was done to study the evolution, long-term evolution of the bottom elevation on a tidal uh, channel in the lab. Uh, the uh, apparatus consists of an uh, oscillating cylinder that generates sinusoidal oscillation in the basin with uh, an amplitude of 0 0.032 meter and a period of 120 seconds. The tidal wave propagates on the basin and it enters a channel having an exponential decrease in width. The bed material is, a co is cohesionless, and it consists of a, a, a um, hazelnut shell, broken hazelnut, hazelnut shells with an diam uh, average diameter of 0 0.3 millimeters. And this is the density. This is a mathematical numerical model. These are the, 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 equation, you, the equations you saw before. The only peculiarity is the treatment of the uh, wetting and drying processes. Uh, this is important because uh, we, on the, on the uh, physical experiment, we have uh, that uh, a beach forms at the end of the tidal channel. So it's very important to deal with wetting and drying processes. So we here consider that uh, the bottom elevations are dis distributed according to a Gaussian probability density function, where the amplitude of ground irregularity are two times uh, the variance of the distribution. For the morphodynamic, you use the classical Axon equation for computing the variation of bottom elevations uh, as a function of the, um, the gradient of uh, uh, bottom uh, of bed load transport plus the uh, source terms due to the position and uh, erosion. And this is the classical diffusion, diffusion advection equation for suspended load. We compute the entrainment minus the deposition in this way. And this is the intensity of bed load rate uh, expressed uh, as a function of the uh, bed load. And the uh, sediment transport is computed by the formulation proposed by Van Rijn. So this is the hydrodynamics in the basin. So first of all, I want to recall that this is a long tidal channel. And uh, it's uh, like a, it was scaled like a, it, 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 it scales well with the, the Rotterdam estuary that is of a size of 20 kilometers. So you cannot uh, assume instantaneous propagation of a tidal wave in this channel. So and the full numerical, the full set of equations has to be solved numerically. And this is the result. This is a tidal wave. There are some irregularities because the cylinder was not able to create a perfect sinusoidal wave. But you can see that numerical model is able to see to recreate the increase of tidal range inside the channel, and also the fact that uh, during the flood, the, uh, so the flood uh, time is shorter than the ebb time of the ebb phase. So in th this implies that the velocities during the flood are larger than the velocity during the ebb. This is in, in the inner part of the channel. So going landward, you, you pass uh, 
you, you go from a, a situation of almost equal value between flood and ebb, and then you uh, go to a situation of a flood dominated channel. And uh, this is uh, the flow field computed by the numerical model uh, in the basin in proximity of the inlet. So this is the maximum ebb, this is the end of the ebb, beginning of the ebb, and this is the maximum flood. You can see that during the ebb, the, uh, the, this is a, uh, basically a jet on standing uh, stagnant water. And you have that the jet occupies basically the area of the inlet, the section of the inlet. This is the end of the ebb, and this is the beginning of the flood and the maximum flood. You can see that during the flood, the, uh, you have a, 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 a classical example of potential flow. So you can see the difference. During the maximum ebb, you have like, this is the section, the active section. During the maximum flood, the active section is larger. So you can see as the, during the ebb, the velocity are larger, the velocities are larger than during the flood. And this asymmetry on the velocity fields creates a scour in proximity of the inlet. And you can see this on the evolution, morphodynamic evolution of the channel. Close to the inlet, you have a scour. And you have accumulation of sediment at the end of the channel due to the flood-dominated character that you have landward. So this is the, uh, this is the mean sea level. This is the bed profile after 20 cycles, after 500 cycles, and after 5,000 cycles. And uh, it, the model was run, both the physical and the numerical model were, were run for more than 5,000 cycles, but not uh, noticeable differences were noticed. Uh, so the, uh, b uh, the, the physical uh, apparatus was uh, stopped. And the equilibrium configuration was reached. And you can see how the numerical model is able to predict uh, in a reasonable, reasonable way the uh, profile, the monotonic increase of bad profile in the, uh, in the channel. You can see as in the end of at the, uh, the landward part of the channel, you have a formation of a beach. And so the wetting and drying processes are very important in the model. So this is the evolution. We, here we did some uh, numerical experiments uh, uh, considering also the presence of tidal flats flanking the tidal channel. So we consider a, a hypothetical configuration like this. This is a, a six meter deep tidal channel flanked by 0 0.5 deep tidal flats. And we prescribe a, water, a sinusoidal water level seaward uh, and uh, uh, a, concent a concentration equal to the equilibrium concentration during the flood phase. During the ebb phase, the concentration is uh, calculated by the numerical model. No, no flux conditions are prescribed for both water and solid phase in, in the other three bond on the other three boundaries. These are the parameters. We consider very fine sand we have a diameter of 0 0.064 millimeters. And the side resolution varies from 30 to 80 meters at the boundary of the tidal flats. We neglect the presence of a vegetation or a suspension of sediment by wind wave motion. This is the longitudinal profile computed, profile computed by the model on the, on the channel, on the main channel. And you can see that after 5,000 cycles, the, the sediment wave reaches the end of the channel. You have a scour near the inlet, the position landward, a sediment front propagating landward. And the bed evolution is lower and, and slower as the equilibrium is approached. So this is the velocity along the tidal channel with the initial topography and the final topography. You can see that with the initial topography, you, you go from a situation where uh, the channel is ever dominated at the inlet then you go toward a situation where the channel is flood dominated landward. You have an almost dec linear decrease of the maximum and minimum velocity along the channel. While in the, with the final topography, you have a strong reduction of ebb flood asymmetry, and uh, the velocity tends to be sp spatially constant along the channel. So you see how the, the feedback between the uh, bad evolution and the hydrodynamics uh, create a situation which like the erosional power of the channel tends to, to be constant along the channel itself. And so the same applies for the shear stress, 
great differences along the channel, small differences toward the end. Not the same for the uh, suspended sediment transport. And this is the net tidally, tidally average sediment discharge. You can see that it's large at the beginning, and uh, it tends to be very small at the end of the simulation. This is the tidal range. At the beginning, there's, the tidal range is like a diminishing toward the end of the channel. This is the end of the channel. But uh, after, at the end of the simulation, the tidal range is uh, about constant around the, along the channel. This is due to the fact that the, the tidal flats are carved by secondary channels. And uh, these channels allow uh, these channel, channels allow the, uh, the system to drain the water faster, and, uh, and uh, it, uh, less energy is needed to, uh, to drain the uh, tidal uh, flats. And so the, the tidal wave can propagate faster in both the main tidal channels and in the secondary tidal channels. This is a section of a secondary tidal channel. You can see that you have a classical increase of bed elevation. This is the bank elevation. You have, a, you can see that you have like an upward concave profile on the channel and a levy due to the position of sediment coming from the channel to the tidal flat, as it's usually uh, found in the real world. This is the, you can see also you can have a, a funneling, a main channel, you can reproduce a main channel funneling as in the real uh, tidal channel. Uh, this is the exponential decreasing width in the channel. And a, a almost linear relationship can be seen between the cross-sectional area of the creek in Leta and the creek watershed area, as it was shown in Rinaldo et al. How much do I have? Nothing? One minute, 30 seconds. Okay, I want to just show you some uh, uh, numerical results uh, on the Fly River estuary. The Fly River, estuary, the Fly River is the second river in uh, Papua New Guinea. This is the Fly River is dividing with, in uh, three reaches. This is the lower fly. This is the, an estuary, and it's 400 kilometers long. Uh, there's a, a almost constant uh, water discharge uh, um, and a very high sediment discharge of 85 million tons per year. And the, because the basin is characterized by rapid rate of erosion. This is the, the tidal regime. You have five meters of uh, tide during the spring, during the spring uh, tide and one meter during the nip tide. This is the tidal influenced reach, 400 kilometers. We assume that the well, well mixed conditions are, pre are uh, present in the, uh, in the estuary. And, uh, also, the, uh, the wave energy in the distributary channels is minimal. This is the computational mesh, water discharge and tidal wave. This is the bathymetry. Uh, these are the results for the discharges and the tidal range. You can see the decrease of tidal range in the channel. You can see the discharges are way higher at the mouth of the, of the channel and tends to the constant value at the, uh, the landward at the early junction, the junction with the upstream uh, tributary. This is the, um, this is the, is the this digitalization of the uh, width along the, the fly river. You can see a break on the width in correspondence of the point where the discharges, the, uh, the water flux becomes uh, one, one uh, monodirectional. And uh, this is uh, very interesting. Uh, now, just last slide, and I'm done. So this is what I'm doing uh, now: is just trying to recreate the long-term profile of the estuarine region in a simplified, with a simplified geometry. I've prescribed the average annual discharge concentration with 50% of sun and 85% of mud, and the tide salinity on the uh, downstream area. I start with a, from a constant slope. This is the upper part of the river. This is the estuary. This is, you can see there's a break. This is the, uh, mm, the, the depth uh, obtained by the mathematical charts. And uh, this is the, you just have the Talbeg elevation. But you can see there's a break uh, here. You have like a first slope on the estuary, like downstream uh, decreasing elevation. Then you have an increase of elevation. And then you have the, tidal, the delta front. And this is what you obtain with a nip spring uh, tide. With a, I used the Delta 3 model. 
And this is what you obtain with the uh, uh, M2 uh, component with one meter. And you can see how if you use just the nip tide, you have a high deposition all along the, 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 the estuary. While if you use the nip spring tide, you're not that far. There are some differences, of course, but you are not that far from the uh, present equilibrium configuration. And uh, this is very important because uh, it means that there's a strong, uh, uh, strong deposition during the nip tide, and the sediments are, fla are, flush are flushed out the estuary during the, uh, during the spring tide. And I'll let you the conclusions for you to read. Sorry. There's anyone with a very eager question? I, I really would like to move on to the next slide. Any, any question? Just one? Yeah. Okay. 